Ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair, uh, I have, you have my sympathy with trying to contain us speakers within the 20 minute space, uh, but spare a thought for a team of my colleagues at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, who's currently in South Sudan, running a five week training course for regional leaders from across that war-torn country, trying in a first sort of fledgling attempt to build bridges in that traumatized society. But organizing such an event has been a very interesting experience. Because it's the rainy season in South Sudan at the moment, the roads are impassable. And those participants who could not catch the chartered flights that we had arranged for them has to rely on their own ingenuity to get to the venue, and so often undertake epic journeys to get to the conference. Over enemy territories, swollen rivers, and landmine infested fields. Sometimes such a journey would take a week or so just to get to the venue. And then when a participant arrives at the venue, there's great joy. The program stops, everybody is uh, introduced to the participant, the participant gets a chance to tell the story of his v journey, also his life story, his take on the entire conflict, and whatever else he or she feels like sharing. That could take an afternoon out of the program. So what is normally a three-week program elsewhere, we've budgeted for five weeks in South Sudan. So if I go over just a little bit, then I think <laughs> you will understand. Of course, I'm only kidding. I will be very, very strict within the time limit. But consider the luxury of predictability and how fundamentally important it is for transitional societies to learn to live with unpredictability, change and uncertainty, and how, in fact, any productive outcome in these contexts are completely impossible without embracing profound uncertainty. Uncertainty, of course, is not a new theme. It hasn't arisen in Leiden in 2014. Ancient Greeks mythologized about old Proteus, the old man of the sea and the herdsman of the sea beasts, who just like the ever-changing liquid oceans that he symbolized, showed versatility, adaptability, and uh, versatility by assuming many forms, a lion, a serpent, a leopard, a pig, even water or a tree, depending on what the situation required. More recently, a uh, well-known philosopher, Zygmunt Bauman, wrote about the liquid man of late modernity. Still a man, I noticed, though, but nevertheless, who is convinced that change is the only permanence and certainty is the only, uh, uncertainty is the only certainty. The cherry on the top for me, when I was preparing for this, is to read that the famous uncertainty principle of Heisenberg which we all grew up with in school, is now in doubt. <laughs> Leaving aside the question of how uncertainty can be a principle in the first place. Reflecting on, on this, uh, the, the organizers asked me to share a little bit about my own story and that of my country. And thinking of that led me to question, as indeed the speaker at last night's speaker dinner uh, pointed out so poignantly, the link between two words in English, security and certainty. I would assume that security does not equate certainty, nor does uncertainty equate chaos and confusion. Although there is something like an unproductive, paralyzing, isolating form of uncertainty, hiding in your room, from what seems overwhelming chaos out there and not being able to take action, there's also a productive form of uncertainty that widens and deepens both analysis and action in ways that are absolutely essential to secure a future, not only in my country, but in the world. Security, for me, is a good thing. You all put a high premium, presumably, on reliable access to food and water shelter, education, freedom of violence, medical care. You will all demand the basic uh, right to an ability to influence public life, the public square, and to be protected against intrusions in your private life. You may even, you may even demand the right to meaningful labor. 
Furthermore, you would agree with me, I'm assuming that these elements should be extended to all human beings across the earth. And indeed, that challenge is being taken up right now by societies across the world moving to a more secure existence for all their citizens. But the irony is that these moves are causing massive uncertainty. It's a phenomenon political scientists call political transition. Often, in fact, it amounts to the end of all certainty about what the world looks like, how it should work, even what one may hope for. And when a country changes, each household, each community, each city, each institution, each system changes along with it. Even the landscape looks different after a while. Change becomes the only constant. It asks nothing less of citizens in Egypt, in Libya, in South Africa, and elsewhere, from parting with the world as they knew it. Transi transition, therefore, required exceptionally courageous leaders. But our past in South Africa, of course, the apartheid past, was built on the worst kind of certainty, which in Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher's immortal words, was aligned with Europe's first export product four centuries ago, namely racism. The certainty that white culture, white persons, white thinking was always inherently superior to their black equivalent. Because white and black were fundamentally unequal in South Africa, we believed, it followed they were also fundamentally irreconcilable. And because we could not say it as bluntly as that, yes, even Afrikaners can sometimes be politically correct. We simply proclaimed that we were better off apart than together. Strangely, though, following this absurd proclamation, trying to unscramble the omelette that was our society, we actually began to believe it. And later, to be quite certain of it, and later still to be absolutely convinced, all the while repeating this to ourselves as a mantra that became a self-fulfilling, self-confirming lie. And of course, we also acted on it. We built a country on that basis. We fought divinely blessed wars with that certainty and even called it the fulfillment of a centuries-old dream. It was with that dream which my Protestant ancestors, Mr. and Mrs. Francois de Troyes, fled for their lives from Catholic persecution in Lille in northern France in 1685 to this country and jumped on the first ship to a new life in Africa. But instead of security, our racist certainties nearly, I would say very nearly, destroyed us all. It certainly made South Africa for a while one of the most insecure, violent places on earth. Instead of security, it brought to us profound insecurity. Until, that is, the sun broke through in the form of political reconciliation. The acceptance that we were, in fact, inherently equal, fundamentally interdependent, and thus eminently reconcilable as black and white South Africans. And we can say now, 20 years on, along this very fragile, very uncertain road lay our salvation, our security. Nelson Mandela was, as was F.W. de Klerk, who occupied this podium before, heavily criticized for embracing reconciliation, instead of the much more well-trodden, certain road of revenge, which after all would require nothing more than staying safely inside the known certainties of apartheid or the struggle against apartheid. I saw myself, I left university just as apartheid was crumbling. My generation had a choice, embrace the great uncertainty of a country yet to be born, or walk away to the relative safety of communities and countries where the old certainties could be kept safely, safely intact. As it turned out, some did leave. Others actually came back, and yet some others, unable to leave or unwilling to reconcile, got stuck and migrated inwardly to the land, the never-never land of bygone certainties and nostalgic memory, deprived of any real sense of hope or self-worth, 
I'm not sure hell has much on an existence like that. Yet for those whites who were willing to risk their certainties, reconciliation offered the possibility of redemption and the chance to become African. Mandela, after all, looked me in the proverbial eye and called me an African. I, humbled, accepted that epithet, the freedom to leave behind the pretension, security, and certainty of being a European in Africa for the brand new, incomplete identity of an African of European descent. That has been Mandela's gift to me, and it's the most precious gift I have ever received. Yet it has been disturbing, unsettling, upending cozy assumptions and intimate friendships I thought I could not live without. Uncertainty has dominated my life since. Who am I, this strange animal called an African of European descent? Where am I going? What's my responsibility given my unjust advantages in life under apartheid? Where are we as a community, as a group of a nation going? What about my children? What is their future? But within all this uncertainty, which admittedly is sometimes a little bit exhausting, I know one thing for certain. My children are infinitely more secure today as a result of a previous generation's willingness to entertain uncertainty than what they would have been had the previous generation stuck to their certainties. And so I propose today to you an embrace in it of uncertainty and change that we can call a productive uncertainty, to be distinguished also from unproductive certainty, or what one could call intellectual laziness, and which, if history should decide or conspire so, could become exceptionally dangerous. Even if one thinks it's not necessary to think too hard because I'm on a very safe platform. As I'm sure Edward Smith, the captain of the Titanic, would in better retrospect have agreed. Or indeed Ben Sliney, the, captain, the, the former US Federal Aviation Administration's national operations manager, whose first day in his position was September 11, 2001 or Ben Bernanke, who announced in 2004 an era of great economic moderation just around the corner. Indeed, as Nassim Talib and Mark Blythe warn, don't be a turkey. For a thousand days, the turkey have every reason to believe and trust the farmer. But on Thanksgiving Day, <laughs> when trust is arguably at its height, that poor old turkey is proven dramatically wrong. Humans must try to resist the illusion of control. For to maintain the illusion of control, one has to suppress volatility in the name of stability. But that, this means that analysts trying to predict the future overlook what is called the so-called black swans, the large-scale events outside the norm. And when silent risk accumulates under the surface, when the black swans begin to circle, these systems eventually become fragile and they blow up. To make systems robust, all risks must be constantly kept in the open. To this end, productive uncertainty, productive uncertainty means not isolating oneself, but to keep a keen interest in the world, to understand risks and opportunities, life from the far side, needs to be understood intimately. For risks to become opportunities, we need to learn to work and dream with those who live on the far side. At IJR, my organization, we produce data to find out how ordinary South Africans, indeed Africans across the continent, feel about this project of, of creating an inclusive society to together. We also create platforms for people to come together and engage who might not otherwise have the opportunity or the inclination to do so. My colleague Kenneth Lekuku said once that the rich, largely white world and the poor, almost exclusively black world still operate as if in separate universes and hardly touch sides. As a result, we struggle, we really struggle to engage one another, let alone agree. 
What we need to do, Lukoko said, is create spaces where we can learn to disagree together in a constantly expanding circle of solidarity. Establishing, and this is really the thought I want to um, talk about for the rest of the few minutes um, I have at my disposal, and maybe some grace. <laughs> Establishing ever wider circles of solidarity, like concentric waves caused by a pebble thrown into a pond, is critical to living with productive uncertainty. I say solidarity for a reason. I'm not advocating becoming lone rangers, forever on the run, always loving someone beyond the fresh horizon, but then always leaving before sunrise the next morning. The lone ranger too is isolated in her own way or his own way, just like the person who's never left home. Solidarity indicates that rare ability to cross boundaries, yes, but without betraying former loyalties and relationships. For me, as I saw productive uncertainty work its magic in South Africa, it meant the willingness always to venture out in the unknown. Question and challenge horizons, yes, but importantly, finding others, listening to them carefully, imagining life from their side, and begin to work together towards common goals whilst resisting the temptation to convert them to my side. With other words, allowing them the freedom to remain other, to disagree. In this way, and by drawing on all the communities in South Africa, we were able to craft a beautiful constitution out of the ashes of apartheid. We were able to open a new chapter in international peacemaking with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was where my organization was born. Conduct the world's largest housing project develop Africa's only social welfare system, and one of the best HIV and AIDS programs anywhere in the world. And yet today, South Africa is not paradise at all. One key challenge, for example, is that we've not allowed productive uncertainty in the economic terrain. To bargain really about how much capital do we need to grow, and how much can we actually redistribute to the poor. We didn't allow that debate. And instead of institutionalizing this out-of-box problem-solving, our leaders now instead seems to be digging themselves into smaller and smaller circles. The concentric circles of the previous period seems to be coming back in. Mind you, it strikes me that perhaps it's no coincidence that the EU is short for both European Union and embra embracing uncertainty. Perhaps you too are a society in profound transition. Living in the zone, if one keeps the faith, I believe produces intelligent, smart, and ethical responses to shared concerns. Ironically, withdrawing into the certainty out of fear for change ultimately breeds confusion. Withdrawal breeds confusion, and the inability to see the world for what it is. Embracing uncertainty by contrast, leads to clarity of thought. Take Nelson Mandela. It was in prison that Nelson Mandela recalled that his hunger for the freedom of his own people became a quest for the freedom of all people, white and black. And I quote, I knew as well as I knew anything that the oppressor must be liberated just as surely as the oppressed. And perhaps uniquely, as a democratically elected president, he was able to preside over the first act in the fulfillment of this dream. From young man to lawyer, to freedom fighter, to prisoner, to president, to international icon, Mandela's personal history coincided with the incremental acknowledgement of ever wider circles of solidarity. From living in the intimacy of his rural home village, to joining a political movement, eventually ending up to be a global icon. Beyond the certainties of his immediate community, Mandela found freedom. He indeed was freed by uncertainty. It was not, though, a headlong rush into the unknown, 
but a lifetime of careful movement out and upward. His dynamism was rooted in a deeply reflective and thoughtful approach, underscored by 27 years in prison. He was no lone ranger, but he was also no maverick. And yet, his reflections forever pointed him towards the horizon. It allowed for productive uncertainty between his past, his present, and his future, and between his story and that of his compatriots and adversaries alike to pull him forward, to mold, to polish and refine his best attributes. Harnessed by the belief in ever-widening solidarity, it produced a leader who could think clearly as a result of embracing uncertainty. And the example of that, which I will conclude with, is that on the eve of the dawning of the new South Africa, the former head of the apartheid army, Constant Fulyun, attempted a mini coup in the, black, uh, the backwaters of South Africa, in a remote area. Possibly, we think now, as a trial run for a larger military takeover. I phoned him the other day, General Fulyun. He's now 80, still farming. I asked him, General, is it true what they say, that the next day after your failed coup attempt, President Mandela phoned you up? He said, yes, indeed. I said, what did President Mandela tell you? He says on the phone to me, President Mandela, the, he was then president in waiting. President Mandela in waiting said to him, General, we cannot beat you militarily, but you cannot kill us all. Sooner or later, white and black people will have to figure out how to live together. Why don't we do it now before we kill large numbers of one another's communities? That kind of clear thinking, I believe, comes with living with a productive kind of uncertainty that pushes you forward into ever-expanding circles of solidarity. Thank you.